So, we're going to break tonight into three different sessions. It's a little different than what we typically do on a nerd night, which is three 20 minute presentations with a 10 minute break in the middle. Tonight, we're having 15 two minute presentations in blocks of three. So, we're going to have five presentations and then five, five or six questions and then a 15 minute break and repeat. Um, so, if you haven't been to a nerd night before, <laughs> uh, this is a condensed history, basically, and if you have, I apologize, you've seen this slide probably 20 times. Um, okay, starts in Boston. This guy named Chris studies indigo birds and goes really nutty over them, leaves, goes to Cameron, studies them, comes back to his bar and everyone's like, we missed you, where have you been? It's like, indigo birds, they're awesome. Uh, you should know about them. We should get drunk and I'll do a presentation about it. <laughs> and then uh, he's like, hey, don't you know something to talk about? Yeah, so they're nice uh, Matt here, not his real legs, um, goes to the first, <laughs> goes to the first <laughs> nerd um, in Boston and is, but lives in New York and is like, this is amazing. I'm gonna take this to New York City where all of these things get started. Um, or keep going, I don't know. Um, then JC lives with this guy. JC moves to Austin, takes to Austin, um, Texas. And then Dave. <laughs> Dave, Dave is over here somewhere. He spoke at the first career night Austin and then Trucks and Dave live here. And they really just it, so they brought it to us. And now we've been doing it for 20 months now. <laughs> Future speaker, social media, media being is okay. We're on Twitter at NerdNightKS. We like the hashtag A N N L F K. Getting a drink is okay during presentations. Uh, t shirts, stickers, and now. Eight more seconds. Thank you so much, Posh Mamas. We love you. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fast, but it's going to be memorable. Wait, that's what you so, said. first presentation. Here are the poster titles. The first one is fairly easy to recognize. 
uh, it's The Godfather. Uh, the second one, the first poster I ever saw, and kind of blew my mind, is Ghostbusters. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, some problems too is anti-Semitic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to hire college educated girls because they would be grateful for the job and accept low pay. Um, and sexual harassment finally ended his career in 1905. He got kicked out of the American Library Association, the association that he helped actually found. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's <laughs> <laughs> to multiple other divisions. Uh, there are now probably a dozen different sports around the country or internationally that are related to or derived from Dagger Gear. We are the original. Uh, <laughs> the rules are really simple. You're getting out there with a padded weapon. It's a one hit sort of deal. You hit the arm, can't use your arm anymore, gotta drop the sword or shield or whatever you're holding in your arm. Uh, get in the leg, get to the knee, get in the torso, you're dead. Uh, the games are organized kind of similar to paintball. We play catch the flag, or think of the hill, or kill everybody on the other side. Um, <laughs> right now, uh, it's a national organization. Uh, there are thousands of people in the country who play. There are hundreds who play locally. Uh, our local realm, Emberfeld, uh, is getting really popular. It's really big right now. We're growing strong. Uh, tomorrow night, we are actually holding our weekly practice out at Clinton Park. It's out on 6th Street. It's out near the hospital or Pickney Elementary School. We welcome everybody to come out. We really would love to see new people. We like hitting new people. <laughs> people are used to fighting. Um, okay. um, I spammed the entire room with my business card. Uh, there's one on, I put one on every table. I put piles in front of the tip jars. I have hundreds personally. I strongly encourage anybody who's even vaguely interested in, it's not butter, uh, to come out and talk to me and come out tomorrow and check us out if you have a chance. Uh, I personally cannot be bothered to exercise ever. I'll do one push up. Uh, but I will go out there every single Thursday and sometimes on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays. And I will work my ass off for three hours straight and then all of a sudden I'm done and I'm completely exhausted and completely beat up and I love it. It's amazing. Uh, if you like anything competitive, if you like Dungeons and Dragons, if you like computer games, I uh, don't want to be sitting on the couch that one night. It's awesome. Please come out and try it. Thank you, everybody. Please come talk. We're going to get started with Chad. Chad is going to come on up. Yeah. So, Chad will be presenting time travel theory and advice for two minutes in the future. <laughs> Okay, so, first of all, it is awesome. Yes, we know it on a file, we can travel in time. In fact, it's all about being able to travel faster, and that makes you travel in time. The faster you travel in time, the slower time moves. So you can move in a minute's time what Earth time, let's say, would take about centuries at the right speed. And this is great because, well, it's awesome. This isn't science fiction, this is fact. This means that not only through speed can you travel faster, but also through ground. So moon clocks, let's say. Moon clocks. Clocks that are on the moon, they travel at a slower time. Or take it back. They travel at a faster time. Uh, <laughs> no, slower, sorry. So when there's more gravity, when there's more gravity, move, time moves slower. So our clocks here are moving a lot slower than they are on the moon. This was discovered because satellites weren't really working very well. So they were to qualify that, holy shit, our satellites are moving faster than we are. This doesn't really have a functional purpose yet. There's a lot more money being poured into going to Mars there is than going further in the future because we can't really bring back all the results from that. Other than that, you can see you did it. And you can kind of prove it through math. But at the moment, it's just a really cool thing we can do. Uh, in the same way, if you were to get a hold of a black hole and you orbit around it, and you find yourself in a space capsule there for a week. You come back to Earth, no one you know, no one you know, children, children, children you know, are there anymore. It's a very Planet of the Apes kind of situation you find yourself in. And if I ruin that mood for somebody, I'm kind of glad I did. <laughs> uh, so, what you can do though is you can move forward in time. At this point, and really at any point in the future, we're not going to be able to move backwards in time. Time travel from the past is not possible. Uh, that is because we have to move at or past the speed of light to functionally travel backwards in time. And that's what Stephen was being a dig about. Uh, <laughs> you can't move backwards in time unless you're able to find a wormhole, but that's also theoretical. Wormholes exist almost purely in science fiction and in equations. So that's all my bad news. And that's some advice about why not to travel back in time is you don't want to sleep with your mom, but my time's up. <laughs> Yeah. Alright, so next up,
Karen. <laughs> so, Karen will be doing Drawing a Human Head 101. And uh, I can't believe really said this, but I signed up for this and I was drunk the last time. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to draw a human head using proportions and measurements. And what I have here is uh, a face for the front. And uh, they're not, you're not always seeing a face from the front, so I also showed a visual in the back showing a face from the side. And I'm going to show you the steps it takes. Okay, first of all, we're going to, uh, this is a face, and we're going to put a dividing line that divides one side from the other. Then we're going to uh, go from the top and the bottom, and we're also going to draw another line that goes straight across. Now, the most common thing that people do the most common mistake people make when they draw a face is they draw the eyes way far up. And actually, the eyes don't come until halfway down. And so we'll just kind of add some eyes here. And, uh, and then we're going to draw another line for proportions in between this halfway point and the chin. Right here, that's where about the nose would hit. And then the eyes would fit, I mean, and then the ears would fit in between the ear. And then uh, one more measurement between here and the chin would be another one that's about where a mouth would go. So those are the basic proportions. And then from there, you would add all of your details. So you would add things like hair and eyebrows and, uh, and things like that. When we add the hair, it's going to look a little more, um, <laughs> it's going to look a little more like a face of what used to. And I think it'll make a way more sense of where the eyes will fit. And then you can also do a little bit of shading and things like that. And from there, we just keep adding details and adding details. And that, that is base, the basics to drawing a human face. Resurgence 
41% of the general Russian population is Orthodox, and only 0.5% are Buddhists. But here, 27% uh, are Orthodox, and about 20% are Buddhists, plus another 25% that are spiritual but not religious, so I'm counting them as semi-Buddhists. So the Buddhists win, <laughs> yay! <laughs>
he'll say, Thomas Edison, he's the man to get us into this century. <laughs> and that man is me. <laughs> they'll say, autopsy at my autopsy. <laughs> Uh, sign languages 
have a really long history. A lot of linguists think that they were actually um, used before spoken languages were. But because sign languages are technically oral languages, meaning that they don't have a written form, we don't really have a lot of information about early sign languages. There are references to early deaf communities in um, like the works of Plato, for example, but other than that, we don't really know too much. Uh, American Sign Language, though, has a really distinct history, and it starts out with a man named Thomas Gallaudet, and he lived in the early 1800s in Connecticut, next door to a girl named Alice, who was deaf. And Alice, um, he saw that she was really smart, but that she didn't have anywhere to go to school. So he kind of took it upon himself to bring uh, deaf education to the United States. And so he went to Britain, because in Britain they had a history of deaf education that he was aware of. But when he got there, they were really snotty, and they were like, we're not going to help you, sorry. <laughs> so he ended up going to France, which also had a tradition of um, deaf education. And while he was there, he met Laurent Claire, who was a deaf Frenchman, who agreed to come back to the United States and teach in a deaf school in the U.S. And so him and Claire established the American School for the Deaf in 1819 in Connecticut. It was the first school for the deaf. A lot of the people that went to school there were actually from Martha's Vineyard. And Martha's Vineyard has a really strange history of deafness on the island because at one point in time, uh, there were more deaf people living in Martha's Vineyard than hearing people, hence the joke cartoon. Um, but so when those students came to the school, they brought Martha's Vineyard Sign Language with them. And so French Sign Language and Martha's Vineyard Sign Language kind of meshed together in the school. And so American Sign Language is actually a blend of those two languages. So American Sign Language was spread around the rest of the country by opening up of deaf schools, um, including Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., which is the first deaf college um, in the world, only taught in sign language there. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually signed that into charter, and you can see uh, on his statue that that's commemorated because his hands are in the shape of an A and an L. Oh. And today, around the world, these are the countries that use sign language, uh, American sign language, as their primary language. Uh, I had to get a map in there if you know me. So. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have Adrian. 
who is presenting the lost president. The years between the early revolutionary period and the Continental Congress in 1774, the Articles of Confederation in 1781, and George Washington's inauguration in 1789, Congress was moderated by a duly elected president. As the chief executive officer of the government of the United States, the president was recognized as the head of state. While technically not filling the same role of the executive branch under the current Constitution, it's still important to understand that the United States had an organized system of government during these 14 years, and this period of American history is comparatively understudied and underanalyzed. The following 14 men served in the position of President of the United States. Peyton Randolph of Virginia never lived to see independence, but he was numbered among the nation's most revered founders. Henry Middleton. John Hancock, he signed the Declaration of Independence twice and also served as President twice. Henry Lawrence, the only American president ever to be held as a prisoner of war by a foreign power. Captured and put in the Tower of London until after the Revolutionary War, the U.S. traded Lord Cornwallis to get him back. <laughs> after he was released, he was heralded as the father of our country by no less a personage than George Washington. John Jay, John Jay Wright wrote the Help Write the Federalist Papers, America's First Secretary of State, First Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Samuel Huntington, Thomas McKean, later as governor of Pennsylvania, he introduced the spoil system to America with his strict policy of only appointing fellow Republicans to office. Uh, John Hansen, uh, Elias Boudinot, uh, one of his grandchildren became the leader of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Thomas Mifflin accepted Washington's resignation after uh, his military commission was complete. Richard Henry Lee was the great uncle of Robert E. Lee. He was on the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence until he was called home because his wife fell ill. He was replaced by his young protege, someone you may have heard of, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Nathaniel Gorham, Arthur St. Clair, and Cyrus Griffin, during his term, the Constitution was ratified and finalized. He served as the nation's chief executive until George Washington's inauguration on April 30th, 1789. Basically, they, were, they gave him the Journey CD box set, locked him in a room with a banjo, and four hours later, he was playing every Journey song in the world on banjo. Mark would not play guitar in a remote CD, remote control CD player. The orchestrations were painstakingly interpreted for punk guitar. Now, it took six weeks, 80 pots of coffee, and two weeks, and 80 cases of beer to rehearse it. But, but Schwann recorded Punk Site Story in three days in March at Oakland, California's Polymorph Studio. They performed the album in its entirety with full cast once at Berkeley's 924 Gilman, famous for where Green Day, Operation Ivy, Rands, they all got their start, on March 12, 1994, the day after they completed the album. Now, why is that fucking wonderful? The reason it's fucking wonderful is because, as Ryan Cooper from About.com stated, by reinterpreting the music, revising the original scores, and reinterpreting the punk, hardcore, and ska interjections, 
They reveal what they've known all along. Beneath the Broadway veneer and choreographs and dance moves, the characters in the original musical were just a bunch of punks. They were punks by definition before there were modern connotations attached, but they also weathered the transition to the modern definition perfectly. It's a cover of a cover, much in the same way that Bernstein and Sondheim updated Romeo and Juliet for the 50s in New York, Dave Mello and Friends updated West Side Story for the 90s in Berkeley. And lastly, it's not just the only full album cover Shalom did. They also put out a seven-inch entitled Tumors the year before, where they covered Fleetwood Mac's Rumors on 100 